Hi Bobcats! In this video we're going to take a look at some of the earliest modern experiments that were done to try to figure out this fundamental structure of matter. Our first objective is to look closely at some of these experiments and we want to describe both the experiment and the understanding that we developed from that experiment. And um, again, just recognize that our scientific understanding changes over time as we accumulate more experimental data. Antoine Lavoisier was a French nobleman who, for, who performed um, a very elegant experiment. It was well known in Lavoisier's time that these two chemicals shown in these two watch glasses were related. The chemical on the left is mercury and from our modern perspective and on the right hand side it's mercury oxide. The, um, if you take the stuff that's on the right, that red powder, and you heat it up, it will turn into liquid mercury. From our modern perspective, we say that the mercury oxide decomposes um, and uh, it loses the oxygen, leaving behind just the mercury. So it was known in Lavoisier's time, because they had good balances or scales available to them, that if you took that red powder and heated it up to turn it into the liquid mercury, the mass decreased, the mercury weighed less than the mercury oxide. So Lavoisier thought, hmm, what's going on here? Most scientists at the time just thought that the matter just disappeared. But Lavoisier said that doesn't quite make sense. So he tried to see if he could trap whatever was disappearing from this red powder. So he ran his experiment inside a sealed ampule. An ampule just means something like a test tube. And the fact that it's sealed just means um, that after the, the red powder was added to the tube, you use some glass blowing techniques to just seal off the tube. And something crazy happened when Lavoisier did this. Um, the Mercury oxide turned into mercury, as you can see in this, this image. This, in this image, the reaction's not complete. You have a mixture of the mercury oxide and those drops of mercury that you can see on the side. Um, but when he weighed the tube after it was all done, it weighed exactly the same as it did before. And Lavoisier had managed to trap all of that oxygen that was being released by the reaction. Based on these experimental results, Lavoisier proposed the law of conservation of mass. You know, he saw that if he, he decomposed 100 grams of mercury oxide and he did it in a sealed container, in the end he still had 100 grams of stuff. Now it just was 92.61 grams of mercury and 7.38 grams of oxygen. So the statement of the law of conservation of mass says that the total mass remains constant during a chemical reaction. So if you add up the mass of all of your reactants, all of the stuff that you start with, that has to equal the sum of the masses of all of the things that you end up with. Mass is neither created nor destroyed. Around the same time that Lavoisier was doing these experiments, Proust did some very careful measurements on the elemental composition of various substances. So for instance, he got samples of water from all over the world, from France, from Spain, and from the New World. And he discovered that no matter where the water came from, by mass, it was 89% oxygen and 11% hydrogen. He found the similar type result for copper carbonate. No matter where the copper carbonate came from, it was 50% copper, 40% oxygen, and 10% carbon. Based on these experimental results, Proust proposed the law of definite proportions. In a compound, the constituent elements are always present in a definite proportion by mass. Definite, in this case, has kind of a special meaning. It means that um, it's a fixed proportion or a not changing proportion. Here's an example of how we might use the law of definite proportions. If you have 12 grams of carbon and they combine with 32 grams of oxygen, 
you can make carbon dioxide. So let's figure out how much oxygen would be present if you in carbon dioxide if you had 24 grams of carbon. Well, there will always be the same ratio uh, between carbon and oxygen. And from our initial information, we know that there are 12 grams of carbon um, for every 32 grams of oxygen. Um, and now, instead of having 12 grams of carbon, we're asked about 24 grams of, of uh, carbon. So that 12 grams gets doubled going up here to 24. And so we can do the same thing with oxygen to keep the proportion straight. We'll have 32 times 2 is equal to 64 grams of oxygen. So if we have a sample of carbon dioxide that contains 24 grams of carbon, it also contains 64 grams of oxygen. Berzelius performed some further experiments that gave weight to the law of definite proportions. He found, for instance, that if you took 10 grams of lead and you reacted it with 1.55 grams of sulfur, you would get 11.55 grams of lead sulfide. That was the magic ratio uh, to, for combining lead and sulfur to get lead sulfide. So he said, well, you know, what if I do this experiment and I give the lead a little bit too much sulfur? So there's extra sulfur. Will it just get absorbed into making lead sulfide? Well, when he did the experiment, what he found was if he still started with 10 grams of lead and he gave it more sulfur than was necessary, he still got the same amount of lead sulfide, 11.55 grams, but now he had 1.45 grams of sulfur left over. So the compound still wanted that same ratio um, and the extra sulfur that he offered was not used. He said, okay, so maybe it's just something having to do with sulfur. What if I give it too much lead? So he used the same amount of sulfur that he used in the first experiment, 1.55 grams, and he now gave it extra lead. Instead of doing 10 grams of lead, he gave it 18 grams of lead. So guess what? He had eight grams of lead left over in the end because that amount of sulfur only wanted to react with 10 grams of lead, leaving another eight grams left over. All of this supports that idea of definite proportions, that there's a magic ratio for this compound, lead sulfide, of the, for this ratio between lead and sulfur. To wrap up, let's take another look at our objectives. We wanted to look at experiments that led to our modern concept of an atom. We want to be able to describe both the experiment and the resulting understanding. And we're recognizing as we look at all of this that scientific understanding changes over time as we get more experimental data.